Hi, this is Ben Atma and I'm here with Carl Frey at Oxford University. I've just had the pleasure to read your new book, uh, The Technology Trap, which I absolutely loved. And um, what you do in this book is you look at the economic and societal impact of technology. And you go back through history and say, okay, we've been there before. Um, we've had previous industrial revolutions that have changed society, that has cha have changed our economy and our job market. Um, what would you say is the closest example to what we're experiencing today? If we go back in history, have we really seen this before? Because um, you, you hear other people saying, now we have artificial intelligence and machine learning and virtual reality and so many blockchain, so many different technologies coming together that this is something we've never experienced before. How would you respond to that? Well, I think every time is different. There's no question about that. Uh, but the only thing we have to go on in analyzing the present and the future is the past because it's the only time we have any data. Uh, mm. And I think what history does, it put current times in perspective and I think that is something that is very much needed in the debate that we're having because if you go back to the 1960s uh, and pick up the New York Times uh, you will see that we had exactly the same debate back then. So if you go back to the 1930s you would see the same pattern over again. If you go back to the 1830s, uh, same discussion. And, and one fun, uh, thing I found very extraordinary when I was researching this book is how much technology has progressed over the centuries, but how much the debate surrounding its effects has not. And I think that one common pattern in history, uh, and that applies to today, is that technology is likely to be more assisted when it replaces people's jobs and skills rather than augments them. And there it doesn't you know, matter whether you're replaced by artificial intelligence uh, or a spinning machine. Mm. Uh, the effect for you, for yourself, your self-esteem and your income um, is the same. Um, and what I do in the book is that I try to draw some parallels between uh, current times and the first industrial revolution, which was the most sort of similar period. Uh, that we've been through in terms of economic tra trajectories. Mm. So we saw that that was a time when middle income jobs disappeared very much right, uh, like this time around. Mm. Uh, we saw that uh, inequality was on the rise, wages failed to keep track with productivity growth, so the labor share of income was falling. Um, and it was also a time of a lot of social uh, unrest and political polarization, mm. um, as we are seeing today. So I think those parallels clearly apply, uh, but then there are also many differences, right? So the technology, as you mentioned, uh, is very different in many ways, although it has similar effects in terms of replacing uh, many people's jobs and, uh, and skills. Um, and what we also see is a big, big difference, of course, is the political system. So back in the uh, 19th century, most people who went out and smashed machines, like the Luddites, for example, and they were politically disenfranchised, right? Proper mm. ownership was still a requirement for voting. They weren't represented by the labor unions or anything. And they had much less political voice than people um, have today. And mm. you know, unlike voting with sticks and stones that people uh, did back then, most people in, in the West are now showing up uh, at the elections. And they're showing their dissatisfaction through political uh, means rather than uh, uh, violence uh, as they did back then. So would you say that some of the popular uprising that we're currently experiencing in, in Europe and the US is one sign of, of this? Well clearly so we've had an enormous backlash against trade and globalization. We're seeing that play out now between the United States and, and China. And, and Trump won three key swing states, right? That are been won by, every, uh, by, by, by uh, the Democratic co uh, candidate every election since 1992, and that was Michigan, Wisconsin, and, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and what those states have in common is that they were both very hardly hit by globalization, uh, but also automation. So mm -hmm. they're more robust in Michigan alone than in the entire American West. 
And, and we have already seen this backlash against globalization, but automation has had very similar effects. Even with tariffs, uh, the jobs are very unlikely to come back. Most people today actually already work in non-traded sectors of the economy, so they, they are quite shielded uh, from future globalization. The rise of China has already happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are not shielded from automation, they are not shielded from animals and go and autonomous trucks and so on. Those mm -hmm. are jobs that can't be shipped abroad but they can be automated um, and you know, I'm not predicting that we're going to see a similar backlash against technology but I think that's something that a lot of people uh, uh, don't have on the radar and one, one point that I try to make in the book very strongly is that resistance to replacing technologies have been the historical norm uh, rather than the exception and if uh, the fourth industrial revolution as, 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 as uh, it's commonly called um, was something inevitable, right? Every country would have adopted the same technology to the same extent and every country would have been rich as a consequence of that, right? If technological progress was something in inevitable, the Industrial Revolution would have happened a bit earlier uh, in the history of uh, mankind. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's uh, important to remember. So in, in the book you distinguish between in enabling or, or technology that creates jobs and, and those technologies that, that destroy jobs or replace them. Um, can you give me some examples of those? Maybe from the past and then make those parallels in, in, in what we're experiencing today and maybe looking at some of the, the technologies that we're seeing today and whether you see them as replacing or enabling technologies? Sure, so this is work originally by Adarnas and Mogul and Pascal Rastrapo which makes this distinction between replacing technologies and enabling technologies mm -hmm. and I'll look at sort of uh, economic history through the lens of their um, framework in part. Um, but yeah, so if you take for example a telescope, right, it didn't replace uh, any people uh, doing any pre-existing work. It allowed us to look at the moons of Jupiter and do previously unconceivable things and it created new tasks for labor. If you look at the elevator operator for example um, that you know got rid of the operator mm. but we still use elevators more than we ever had, right? We have more skyscrapers um, high-rise buildings are built um, every year but that doesn't create any new demand for people with a good sense of you know uh, timing uh, and the elevator mm. sort of to the floor um, and uh, that has worked in the opposite direction it's replaced people in those jobs and tasks and you can see that different periods of time have been more replacing and more enabling so today if you look at industrial ro uh, robots for example and those have replaced a lot of people in the assembly lines uh, in the factories. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at computer-aided uh, design software, right, it's been made architects uh, more productive, and it's you know, uh, uh, um, if anything, created uh, new activities mm -hmm. uh, for them. Mm -hmm. And so those are sort of two different technologies today. Um, I think the worrying part is that the replacing technologies, as we discussed earlier, tends to sort of affect low-skilled uh, people more. Uh, the enabling technologies of our time tend to help very skilled workers, and we've seen this sort of tendency mm -hmm. of skilled bias technological change, creating new jobs for very skilled people, uh, but worker replacing technological change on the lower end of the income distribution. So, what do you think this will mean for? The, the the future of, of our society and our economy will we see the the Luddites of today rising up and and voting um, in populist politicians or do you think uh, what 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 are some of the things we, we could do then as as societies or as, as businesses if you think about some of the policy makers some of the business leaders what are some of the levers we can pull to maybe help um, some of those people that are at risk of seeing their jobs being replaced. Any, any recommendations? So one thing that I try to avoid in the book is sort of extrapolating from this uh, you know, decades 
and into the future because I think that's been a common mistake. So Marx and Engels both thought that the mechanist factory would lead to the immiseration of working people and they were broadly speaking uh, right about the period they lived through but mm. they could not have been more wrong uh, about the long, the long term. Long term. Mm. And if you go back to the post-war uh, decades, most people, you know, develop models in which, you know, everybody just benefit equally mm. as the economy grow and that was sort of broadly speaking accurate picture uh, of the time they lived in. Mm. Uh, so I'm, you know, trying to learn from history in that way as well and sort of uh, uh, say that we, we, we shouldn't just extrapolate. Mm. But uh, we can at least learn something from looking at the technologies on the horizon and as I discussed earlier, I think most of the technologies on the horizon are likely to create more tasks for skilled people and replace people uh, with lower skill sets and um, that uh, should be of concern in itself for the next sort of coming years and decades and new things may emerge that change that balance but we're already seeing many of these trends uh, for, a, for a number of decades now mm -hmm. and we're already seeing societies becoming more polar polarized uh, and we also therefore need to think about the short-run consequences of this and by the way, when economists say the short run, we're not very specific about what we mean. Mm -hmm. And in the context of the first industrial revolution, the short run was seven decades. And, and during this time as well, it wasn't, you know, the transition wasn't really managed um, at all, right? Mm. So during the time, that time, most, most economists thought that the world was multitution, so that you know, higher incomes would only translate into larger populations. Mm. Uh, with no uh, uh, gains in, in, in income gains in per capita terms. And, and as a result of that, most people thought that compensating the losers to technological change wasn't anything counterproductive because you would just grow the population mm. and they would be worse off uh, in the end of it. And mm. that led to sort of the poor laws, which was actually the only social safety net that existed uh, in Europe. And Britain actually had one of the most generous social safety nets during the Industrial Revolution, mm. which actually might explain why some people uh, righted less against mechanization in Britain than in, in, in other parts yeah. of the world during the 19th century. Uh, but I think what we know today is that we can actually help people adjust with it having you know, any adverse impacts. So the world is not an institution and we can use you know, educational policy to help retraining people. We can you know, use housing policy to build more housing when new jobs are being created. We can build more infrastructure to connect declining and, and expanding places because the new geography of jobs is very different from the past. All new jobs tend to cluster in very sort of skilled cities. At the same time as its jobs are disappearing in you know, all manufacturing cities, uh, we can use the tax systems to compensate people at the lower end of an income and distribution. And housing is an interesting example. This is um, something I've, uh, uh, until I wrote the book, I, it was never as clear to me how important this is because you've got Silicon Valley places where people, even with a quite modest income, find it really difficult to, to find a, a, a good house. Yeah, um, I'm, and I'm finding it hard to find a good house in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Same here, Cambridge, <laughs> London, almost impossible to, to buy a place, yes. Yeah, and I think, so one of, one of, the, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't realise is that the main beneficiaries of this has actually been others uh, of real estate because mm. uh, because we have a lot of certain restrictions in these places housing supply uh, tends to fail to keep pace uh, with demand uh, and because uh, people that works in work in skilled sectors of the economy uh, they tend to go out and you know uh, uh, buy a lot of in-person type of services so a lot of low skilled people providing those in-person type of services have to move into these places mm. as well and they are really struggling to afford to mm. live there. So I think this is... And it's strange. Of, uh, People in the past predicted that actually in the future you don't need to live in certain places to get great jobs. But actually what we're seeing is this concentration of skills. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Apple just invested, they just made an announcement that they want to invest in housing in California to encourage people to, to move there, which is... Do, do, you, do you think this is something that, that companies should actively be doing? Um, making it more... Um, likely or giving people the opportunity to have housing so they can, can move there and, and work there? 
Well, I'm I'm not a, I'm not a business manager, but you know businesses compete for workers in the labor market, and obviously they need to make sure that they're able to attract talent. And if the uh, cost of housing becomes so high that they struggle to do that, well, they can either move their offices to another place, or they can try to make it easier for people mm. to actually uh, uh, live where they where they are currently based. So I think that's, that's so education, right. housing, any other le any levers. Well, so one 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 example that is close to my heart. So I grew up in southern Sweden uh, in a, a small city called Lund, uh, which is close to, to another city called Malmo, which has sort of spe specialized in building ships for mm. most of the. 20th century, and when the shipyard closed down in the early 1990s, Malmo was doing very poorly for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the revival essentially came with the construction of the bridge to Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, people could stay put in Malmo, where housing was cheap, and tap into a booming labor market in Copenhagen, and commute in there. Most people would live. Uh, uh, in Malmö, so it meant that they would spend most of their income there as well, which gave a boost to the local service economy there, and that created a virtuous cycle, and it's now one of the most dynamic labour markets um, in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I think by connecting places, a lot can be um, achieved as well. Uh, I think that the real uh, immigration crisis uh, today is actually that people are not moving enough, mm -hmm. uh, and you know a lot of people uh, sit around in places with 25% youth unemployment um, and don't move and I think we need to actually help people do that uh, uh, you know moving uh, homes can be seen as an investment which requi requires liquidity up front to get the future revenue stream in terms of a new job um, and I think relocation vouchers um, is something that can uh, you know really help mm. um, so I don't think that there is this sort of one policy that will solve everything. Uh, I think that there's a host of policies that you know may seem minor individually, uh, but they can make a big difference collectively. Interesting. And, the, uh, that's one of the points I tried to make in the book. The other two levers that I hear a lot in in this whole world is um, shortening our our work week. Actually, if if we think. There are technologies coming in to replace our jobs. Maybe if we only work three, four days a week, that could free up some of our, us to to do things differently. And and then obviously universal basic income. Um, have you got any views on on those? Sure. So universal basic income. I just don't think it solves the problems. I think people have better consumption possibilities in general than they ever had. Right. We have access to a lot of stuff um, for free. Um, well, education and health care are two exceptions and uh, I think something needs to be done about that but overall uh, I think people are more concerned about their relative position in the labour market and the fact that they are struggling to find jobs which they feel proud of and I think most uh, economists tend to think that the purpose of production is consumption uh, but we actually know that that's not true because people uh, put a lot of meaning uh, to their jobs um, and by introducing universal basic income you're not going to solve that. Mm. Uh, in addition to that if you, you uh, use UBI as a replacement to all other existing schemes that will if anything re increase income inequality because uh, current transfers um, target people at the lower end of the income distribution whereas uh, UBI is received by and um, everybody and mm. um, so I don't think that it's the solution there are good good arguments for it mm. but I don't think automation is one of them uh, and I forgot the uh, other question yeah the other one is reducing our work week right so we've been doing that for <coughs> for about a century um, so but we're taking also <coughs> sorry, very different approaches mm. in Europe and the United States um, and I think Keynes wrote this famous essay back in 1930, right, predicting a 15-hour work week, and I think he would be very surprised with how much we actually um, still work. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is that we compare our current standard of living to our own past, but also to other people around us. So relative income seems mm -hmm. to matter a lot uh, to how we feel about ourselves. 
uh, and that is driving us to work, want to work more mm -hmm. uh, and to continue to work hard to be able to afford those uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, nice holidays and whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, shortening of working hours, uh, I think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind a four or four day work with myself, mm -hmm. but I think you know people's preference point in the direction that you know most people actually don't uh, want to work, yeah. and most people in the US in particular actually want to work more hours mm -hmm. uh, rather than less. I I absolutely loved reading reading the technology trap. Um, what would you say are then the, the what's the key message of the book or the key key points you you, you wanted to make in it? Well, the key summary. point is simply that, you know, uh, continued technological progress uh, shouldn't be taken for granted or uh, as a given. Uh, the past 200 years has been extraordinary in the sense that most people have also accepted technological change as the sort of uh, uh, driver uh, mm -hmm. of growth and uh, prosperity. Uh, but for most people, for history, history people did not. And if large groups in the labor market actually see their incomes fall for four decades now, which is what has happened in the United States. Uh, there's nothing to ensure that such positive attitudes um, are going to uh, continue. Mm. Um, and drawing upon the experience of the Industrial Revolution uh, illustrates that you know, if we look to history, if history is any guidance, uh, resistance could potentially uh, follow, which would be bad for uh, everyone. So we need to think carefully also about the sort of short-run consequences mm. of rapid technological change. Very good. So there's a, a clear message to to decision makers, politicians, business leaders. Actually, we need to take this seriously and prepare for this. So I hope so. Thank you very much, Carl. A real Thanks. pleasure. Thanks for Thank seeing you. me. Thank you.